Hi everyone, welcome to the session of our web series, Fireside Chat with Champions, in which we interview global business leaders, asking them crowdsourced questions relevant to the biggest challenge we face today, COVID-19 and its impact on various aspects of business, and the way we see steer ourselves in current uncertainties. Today we have a very special guest with us, Bian Lee. B, as she likes to be called, is a serial entrepreneur and a founder of the Hungry Lab. The Hungry Lab is a holistic and decentralized platform future-proofing today's youth and workforce and empowering impactful ventures, initiatives, and corporates. B is an entrepreneurial global speaker, futurist, and former investment banker working at the intersection of finance, operations, technology, and social innovation. With more than 15 years of experience working with hundreds of entrepreneurs, innovators, and change makers of all sizes across 30 countries. At the Hungry Lab, the Lee School for the Future, she future proofs and incubates the next generation of problem solvers from students, startups, and corporates mm -hmm. by pioneering a global regenerative economy, the economy. B is a regular speaker recognized across the world, including multiple TEDx talks. Last year, she was recognized <laughs> as a 40 under 40 leader for Southern California, a Rex Karambi Global Fellowship in India, a National People's Award for Citizen Social Justice and Action Instituted by the Citizen and People of India in partnership with the United Nations and the International Confederation of NGOs. She was also installed as a Queen Mother of Tavife, a village in Ghana. Thanks B for accepting our invitation. I would request you to let our viewers know a bit more about you and your current interest and activities. Floor is yours. Deepak, thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, I'm so happy to be here and share some of uh, more about my work and who I am. So uh, my story, you know, is is very long and very diverse and eclectic. So I'm I'm a Chinese American from Iowa, of all places. Yeah. <laughs> so I already have a very interesting background there, and I've worked in so many different countries across so many different continents, and I've had the pleasure of working with social entrepreneurs, change makers and business leaders um, in all parts of the world. And what I love about what I do now at the Hungry Lab is, to simply put it, we are preparing the world and people for the future. And the future is uncertain, it's volatile, and many people are scared, many people are anxious, uh, especially regular folks, just like, you know, uh, the you know mom and pop shops, the factory worker, the teacher, the student, and even the startups and the entrepreneurs and the scientists. And we are creating educational foundations and platforms and curriculum and programs, working with universities, working with accelerators, incubators, working with our partners on the ground, and working with uh, young change makers, young and old uh, change makers all around the world. And uh, trying to create not just a resilient ecosystem, but a regenerative platform where everyone can thrive and take their ideas into reality and where people can really utilize their strengths and their talents um, and to really innovate for the future. And that's what we're doing at the Hungry Lab. That's, that's, that's awesome things you are doing. Like, you know, I really appreciate because uh, today in the world of uh, uh, venture capital funding rounds, series A, series B, series C, sometimes we start losing the context. The context is that how to make our lives better, the lives of our fellow human beings better. And which is exactly what you are doing. So thanks for doing that. Uh, I would also like to touch upon here a very, very important aspect of your life, right? Because we are talking about COVID. I, I read uh, in some, some place that you have been infected by malaria five times, including all the places in Africa. Three times. Three times. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Three times. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I, it was funny. Yeah, it's funny because I was actually introduced at a conference um, by a dean of public health, um, as saying this is the woman who's gotten like three out of the four kinds of malaria or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I've been introduced in all sorts of ways. Um, yeah. So it, I was work, and that actually being on the grounds. This was about. Oh my god. Um, half a lot, literally half a lifetime ago, and you know, working in rural Ghana, and um, you know, I, I love Ghana. It's an amazing country, and we're working really on grassroots empowerment of local villages there, and having firsthand experience of getting malaria. And the first time I got malaria, I had got it with typhoid at the same time. So I mean, it's <laughs> so you know, it's quite an experience, and you start understanding and, and observing and realizing the differences in public health. 
and you know resources and that really gets you to start observing the world in terms of um you know systems and how they can be uh improved or you know best practices leveraged from one part of the world to another part of the world um to make and uplift make people's lives better and you know i've i've had fortunate um you know experiences with uh having to un unfortunately being you know sick in various countries i've also had the fortunate experience of seeing healthcare and and what works and what doesn't in various places too and so when you ha that's just one example of taking life experiences and creating and and having lessons from them that you can create to observe patterns and look at how we can actually make things better from taking one thing from some place and adding it with one thing in another place and so this has been the story of my life and how i've dealt with things uh and really always asking that question you know as a scientist and um it, you know how can we make things better and as an entrepreneur as a problem solver how can we actually take this into reality and make it sustainable uplift people's lives but also help people make an income right and 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 that is always been that drive and i've i think i would credit my global uh background my diverse experiences working on all levels of the economic stratosphere i've worked with you know uh heads of state uh, in a previous job billionaires i've worked with smallholder kenyan farmers you know in the field and everybody in between and so it helps you develop a perspective a very wide and curious open perspective that many people who may just have been in one silo in one career trajectory may not have and so we need all different kinds of perspectives no you are very lucky you are very lucky to yeah. be in the right country i also travel across africa and ghana is one of the safest mo most democratic stable and pretty decent country when it compares to the other part of africa so in fact like you know i have a story i i i had infection in congo and and believe me i have a very different experience <laughs> so, <laughs> so that that brings us to our first question uh, as you said that you are having such a wide experience across latin america africa southeast asia america uh, at the same time as you rightly said very very diverse type of strata like you know, from base of the pyramid to the like you know top of the pyramid you would like to understand from you that for social entrepreneurship or for startups focus on social challenges how do you see covid impacting them going forward i think in the immediate uh impact of covid is definitely going to force a lot of startups to um really focus on the practical elements cash flow right um workforce uh employees fundraising aspects you know there's all these uh, immediate challenges many startups now have maybe um had you know funding potential now cut off right as investors change their mind change their strategies a lot of startups in the beginning you don't have so much cash on hand right so what do you do how do you and but i think once we cross that hurdle covid is unleashing a blank slate for new disruption creativity i mean for us to create a new normal because what the 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 normal that we had got us into trouble right and that's what got us into this situation in the first place so there are a lot of opportunities here where people can innovate and come up with new solutions and they say necessity is the mother of invention True. right and so we're already starting to see a lot of new creative solutions for these problems i had the uh, uh privilege of being a mentor uh and judge for uh one of the largest global hackathons for covid um and it was sponsored by the estonian government and it was a cross collaboration in many countries and we had hundreds of teams from all over the world and it, it was so incredibly uh heartening to see all these young innovators engineers designers you know marketers uh and people coming together and forming teams forming solutions and or new solutions and also pivoting their existing solutions to adapt to covid on all different themes uh, from workforce to empowerment to gender to uh, you know obviously the health outcomes and it i I'm, i'm i feel very optimistic that out of every crisis you know there's opportunity and we're going to see more 
solutions for what we need. I, I would like to add on to the same question. Like, you know, if we see that uh, today, post COVID, uh, some of the very, very visible challenges as a humanity we are seeing is that one is definitely like, you know, uh, epidemics like COVID, right? And, and the healthcare systems across the world, they are broken. Now it is more visible. Previously, we were thinking it's only the developing world which is suffering. But now we are seeing that even the developed world, right, Europe and, and the US is also having the challenges when it comes to healthcare. Uh, second challenge which we are seeing is that the reason for our such a pandemics, right? Uh, one is what we are doing with the climate. So that's that's another big area of concern. And third is actually because of COVID. Now we'll see that hunger again rising. So like, you know, if you see that uh, what we've achieved in past 35 years to come out of poverty and hunger, right? We mm -hmm. go back there within a span of a couple of months. So out of these three challenges, what, according to you, are the most pressing areas where a startup or a social entrepreneur can really contribute meaningfully? They're all so interrelated. I'd say the, uh, the most pending threat that, the biggest threat is, is climate change, right? A as it's been said, we are the first generation to suffer really the, the brunt of the consequences and we're the last generation to be able to do something about it, right? right. Pandemics come and go. This has not been our first pandemic and it won't be our last. Cool. Uh, not to downplay the severity of it, but it is a finite uh, you know, challenge that may continue to extend, but climate change is a much broader existential threat. Those are two very interconnected things, right? Um, COVID has shown that the world can come together when forced to, to do things, uh, to, you know, stay indoors, to, uh, you know, wash your hands, to social distance. All of these things are helping Mother Nature recover, right? And so it is actually having, from an environmental point of view, a positive effect on the climate. Uh, you know, we're seeing so many reports of the skies over Delhi. Finally, you can see the Himalayas, right? Uh, just as one example, and, you know, uh, animals coming back to places where they were driven out. So, but, you know, I, I, it sounds blasphemous to say, as somebody who's been trained as an economist, when I say that, the economy and the pursuance of, uh, you know, pursuing economic growth the way we have been is completely asinine. We have to, in this future, completely redefine what is economic growth, right? Robert F. Kennedy, in a speech in, in, in the late 1960s um, at a university, really talked about how GDP and GNP do not measure the true, um, the, the actual true aspects of a society's health, right? And when we're so just straight laced focused on, you know, just production of goods and, you know, imports and exports, that doesn't measure the readiness of a society, the solidarity of a society to face future challenges, right? All that GDP, America is the wealthiest, you know, as a as nation in the world, couldn't predict that we would have such a horrible time dealing with this pandemic, right? And so many deaths. Because what all of that wealth on paper masked the realness that at the end of the day, no matter how many billionaires we produce, we still depended on our essential workers to keep the country running. The grocery store worker, the doctors, the nurses, right? The bus drivers. None of that is measured in a way that demonstrates the true value of what citizens produce. And what is truly at the core of a society's health, solidarity, um, and, um, and, and readiness for the future. So on a more philosophical uh, perspective, we really need to rethink, and that's what I've been talking about this past year. I've been speaking all over the world on this re what the future holds in terms of regenerative economy. How do we not just be resilient in the face of challenge, but regenerate and create come out new, come out, um, you know, reformed, come out much stronger and with much more of a sense of inclusion, um, economic inclusion, and allowing everybody the opportunity to create something for the future, right? And so this is what um, the conversation that we need to have. 
fair, fair enough. So now that that's been just a little bit of wider. Let's let's broaden our perspective because uh, uh, not just the startup. You also work very closely with the corporates and and trying to humanize them. So so my, my next question is that like you know in the COVID like you know there are some part of the economies, for example, which is having more of contact. Right, they are going to suffer. So when we talk about airlines or travel tourism industry or restaurants, right? While there are some part of the economy which are having very very visible green shoot, for example. Uh, the digital technology, the Zoom, right? So you're seeing the number of subscriber of Zoom and Meet have gone just like you know, skyrocketed. Uh, all these things were there, but unfortunately, people were not leveraging it. So, according to you, which are the specific uh, sectors in the economy uh, which would be having a faster resilience and and uh, bounce back? Well, which are the sectors where you see that, like you know, maybe uh, we would just change. We might not fly too much, so like you know, airlines industry need to actually like you know deaccelerate rather than accelerate. Or maybe like you know, uh, the social distancing will be there for rest of our lives. So maybe uh, to open a restaurant is not a great idea. So I would like to understand your perspective. Which which say top three sectors you believe would be having green shoots, and what three sectors would be like you know slowly slowly will just go to the sidelines of the economy. I think the fastest growing are going to be uh, empowered by the emerging technologies. That um, so any time that we're, we're going to have you know any online you know with the social distancing restrictions uh, and everything we're going to see a, a surge in online activity right uh, and it's so funny I was just talking to another colleague where um, you know she was saying that in the past her previous job didn't allow her to work from home and now it's because they said it wouldn't be productive and now everybody's working from their home and they're having so much more productivity right and so it's changed the way how how we work. Um, so definitely things like Zoom, conferencing, uh, anything that helps people connect when we have to be apart. Um, and so communications-wise, that's going to be a big thing. I think for the travel industry, tourism, all of those things, events, sporting events, those things are, have already taken a hit, and it's going to be seen how long it's going to take for them to recover. And actually, are they going to recover in the same way? And should they recover in the same way? Right? We've seen the environmental impact on over tourism, and many cities had already started putting restrictions, like for example, Amsterdam on the number and Venice on the number of tourists that can come and 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 on all of that. So I think it's a perfect time for us to rethink how instead of just bouncing back how we can actually disrupt and change and improve the industry. I think the future of tourism, I actually was just on a panel about the future of tourism last week. We're going to see um, a lot more purpose-based tourism and a lot more conscious uh, uh, tourism. And so, I, I, which gives me very excited. Um, and so definitely travel, tourism, I think anything that requires um, a lot of high touch areas um, that are non-essential. Restaurants, you can argue both ways. Um, I would say restaurants have taken a huge cut and it is to be seen whether or not they will continue to bounce back um, at the same way. Human beings, we're social by nature, so we still want that connection. They'll just have to think about different ways of doing, doing it. Um, and so what I feel is really exciting is that, you know, with AI and all of these things, it can help us free us and create more mind space and more heart space for us to be more human in terms of the activities that we pursue. So actually in terms of education, it's a fast growing online education is a fast growing industry. And more and more people now are wanting to personalize education, customize their own education outside of traditional schooling. And so what will be interesting is there are so many ed tech companies that are really pushing the boundaries of and, and advancing the future of education. What remains to be seen is how fast can those mindsets of traditional schools and universities catch on. It's one thing to just put everything online. That's just the first step. The second step is, can we uh, now change the content and the, what we're teaching to get people prepared? Because the traditional subjects, so much, it's not what, about what you learn anymore. It's about how you learn, right? And that part is missing, the how you right. learn. 
Right. And so, and, and that's what we've really been working with our partners on the ground to really um, to, to innovate and, and create the foundation for how to learn. So structurally, we're going to see a lot of diff uh, a lot of similarities, some differences, but in terms of the content in which we, um, you know, the whole lens with which we change and adapt to the future is going to be very, very different. And I think it's going to be for the better. Yeah. I would like to ask uh, something which is like, you know, very uh, close to me as well. And because we work very, very, uh, I'll say that passionately in agriculture domain and food security, I also believe is, is, is going to be one of the challenges because if you see that what's happening back home in US, right, where uh, because of uh, lack of manpower, the slaughterhouses which is supplying meat are not there. So now more and more Americans are becoming vegetarian by 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 fourth than the choice. Uh, do, do you see that agriculture technology is, is something which we need to focus very, very strongly in case we want to feed the remaining uh, uh, close to a billion people, which would be like, you know, without food going forward. So do you think that agriculture technology, and I think um, you are also working uh, uh, in advising uh, uh, people on blockchain. I, I saw your photograph with someone in, in, in uh, UAE. Uh, I think you're advising related to the how to use blockchain there. So do you think that the technology which makes the supply chain transparent and fairer, like blockchain, uh, are, are a way forward in agriculture? Definitely. It was already trending that way pre-pandemic, and it's only going to be uh, exacerbated uh, given the demand and the need of the pandemic. So I think coupled with that, we can't talk about food security without talking about water security. And, and water security is actually going to be, and it already is, water is the, the number one issue that we aren't talking enough about. And wars are being fought over it, um, and it's only going to get worse. Uh, for example, the, the, one of the largest national security issues that the U.S. doesn't talk about is the fact that by the year 2030, the largest underground aquifer uh, that feeds and nourishes about two-thirds of America's uh, you know, population is going to be tapped out, the Ogallala Aquifer. And that's significant, right? So these are issues that have long been, um, you know, on the, have long been, uh, uh, um, you know, talked about by scientists, but not enough people in the mainstream consumers, right? Everyday people know about. And agriculture, I mean, our population is still growing. We need to figure out how to feed almost 10 billion people by 2050. We can't grow more land, right? We have to really think about the practices, uh, industrial farming, industrial agriculture, and we think, is that the best way forward when there are so many consequences of that? Obviously, we need to have a fine balance between mass production and health and safety. You know, all those pesticides running off into the water doesn't do anybody good. But we also need to think about people's habits, right? And it's good to see that um, people are eating more meat. I mean, eating less meat, right? Because meat has such a, a big environmental impact. We need to talk about how people are going to change their habits. So. Yes, it's not just about production. Production is only one half of the equation. When we talk about production, because we also already overproduce, it's just about lack of availability, right? And logistics. So the other half is a much more complex factor of politics, of, you know, food politics is such a big thing, of wastage. Food loss, you know, when you have 30 to 40% of the world's food grown that's lost or wasted before it gets to your table. And so we need to think about solutions for storage, for cold, uh, cold chain, for transportation, for all of these things. So it's both supply and it's also education of the consumer. It's both production and it's both prevention of loss and waste. And um, those are all the considerations that we need to think about. And in, in, Con and how we utilize these resources in terms of conservation, 
and in terms of health, environmental, public health, consumer health. So the long, the long-winded answer to your to your question is absolutely one thousand percent yes. Food, water, agriculture, these are the fundamental building blocks of any society uh, and to life. And what I'm really happy to see is that now there's, we're starting to see so many more startups interested in the space and a lot more funding devoted to the space uh, because the, the funding needs to really, uh, the funding goes hand in hand with the creation and the innovation and to take it to market. That's, that's, that, that's a great answer and, and like you know I, I appreciate you also touching the, the other part of the, the equation that is like you know how we consume things because that is also very very critical by just focusing on production you cannot solve this problem to solve this problem you'll also have to see how you consume so th that's very very important insight thanks for that uh, let's come a little bit closer to you like you know uh, the COVID is just not an economical problem it's also a personal crisis for a lot of people like you and me who travel 20 days Right, suddenly we are locked down, we are stuck at one place. Uh, I know you are someone who has done Vipassana and all that, like me. So like, you know, still, still you are more balanced. But I, I would like for the like, you know, benefit of the viewers, how to cope up with such uh, uh, unknown factors like COVID where like, you know, it disrupts you as an individual, right? It changes the whole equation around you. And you are having challenge from the, like, you know, the, the professional part, you're having challenges on the personal part. So how, how do you like, you know, cope up with all this thing? So some, some, some perspective from you, how, how you can be a better version of yourself uh, in this troubled time. I always like to just go back to the very simple phrase, don't worry about what you can't control. Okay. Right. That, keep saying that, say that as a mantra. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and, and sometimes we have to know what we can and cannot control. Well, we can't, we can't control all the outside stuff. We can't control, uh, you know, our leaders. We can't control, uh, you know, the, the people who won't quarantine. Uh, you know, we can't control many things. What we can control is ourselves and our reaction to things, right? And at this time, it's even more important to go within. So um, if, if people don't, uh, haven't meditated, I would highly recommend starting. And there's many apps uh, and many YouTube videos that can teach you the best way to meditate. There's many forms. Uh, maybe you want to try out a few to see what works for you. I would also say have a consistent routine and know that, okay, this morning I'm going to do this, this you know, afternoon I'm going to do this, this evening I'm going to do this. So it provides a little bit of balance. And I would say still eat healthy and try to get some exercise. Yoga is great uh, if you can't go to the gym. And be grateful, right? And every, I think to start off the day, you know, and, the, and to end the day with a gratitude list of what are you grateful for, right? We're stuck inside. That's okay because at least we're not in the hospital, right? Um, you know, we don't have enough uh, food supplies, but that we're grateful that there are still people going to work and providing food and stocking the shelves for us, right? Right. Um, and so all these little things and it just really appreciate what you do have. And so it's very simple, appreciation, gratitude, and breathing. Most people don't breathe properly, right? It took me so long into my adulthood before I you know, realized that I wasn't breathing properly. And we're not taught to breathe and it seems so silly and so stupid to say, but most people walk around not breathing enough. And when we're not getting enough oxygen to the brain, it affects our nervous system. It creates more panic. It creates because, you know, it's a fight or flight response. Your brain thinks you're in fight or flight because you're not getting enough oxygen when you're taking short, shallow breaths. And so it makes you more tense, more anxious for no reason. Long, deep breaths. Always great to calm you down. I do pranayama every morning. And, um, and I think it's, it's, it's a very helpful practice to get into. And there's, you know, look, go on YouTube and, and there's so many people teaching pranayama. Uh, and so I think just small, small things and, and do something that you love and don't put too much pressure on you, um, to be productive, right? We see all these people saying, oh, it's a great time to be creating your next creative genius work and, you know, all of that stuff. And, and yes, while you can, that's amazing if you do, it's okay that also if you don't, right? Mm. It's okay to take a nap during the day. It's okay today to take the day off. It's Okay. 
we're all on different timelines. We're all adjusting and navigating this unknown. And so chill, right? Practice your self-care and really take time to, um, to take care of yourself first, right? You, you can't do anything without your physical body, your mental wellness. And it's important if you just want to spend the whole day, you know, watching movies, go ahead, right? If that's what helps you, do it, right? Don't feel guilty about it. So I think this is forcing everybody to slow down a little bit and make us appreciate what we used to take for granted and allow us more time to have those critical conversations with ourselves because most people don't talk to themselves as much as they should. Um, and, and getting to know yourself. And I think that that's really important. And sometimes that may be hard, right? Um, not all people like the company they keep, right? And I think it's a perfect opportunity to get to know yourself better. That's, that's, that's awesome advice for uh, those who want to like, you know, uh, come out of the stress which all the things around them is putting them into. So thanks, thanks for this awesome answer. Uh, that brings us towards the like, you know, the, the last section of this discussion. Uh, here actually we would like to understand from you the silver bullets that uh, what startup three four five things according to you they should be doing so that actually they can emerge out of this situation uh, as a success rather than actually like you know as you know that maybe 40 to 50 percent of startup will just die because of covid and again uh, i would like to caveat it that those startup who ends their journey here nothing wrong with it uh, startup is not the life right there is life ahead before and after startup but in case you want to give suggestion to startups how they can survive during this uh, trouble time, what those four or five things would be? I would say practically, uh, immediately, we've seen um, a lot of startups renegotiate uh, in terms of, you know, cash is king, right? So renegotiating payment terms, everyone is willing to be flexible at this time. So just, you know, it's, it's worth a phone call to supply, suppliers and vendors uh, to renegotiate payment terms at least to keep that cash running. That's a very practical thing that people can do. You know, um, relooking your budget, right? Redoing your financial projections, being more realistic, pivoting and being creative uh, in terms of how you can take whatever existing solution you do have and use it towards what people are needing at this time. Keeping those relationships alive Right. Even though you know, we've had a number of startups where projects were paused, postponed, canceled, that doesn't mean that your partnerships don't exist anymore. Right. Keep those relationships going. Right. And then you know who knows how you can you, you where you can pick up after and continue. Right. Uh, but it's it's important to keep, maintain those relationships. And uh, we, we've seen a number of people shift their product um, to to online. You know, and that's fantastic and when we had service-based uh, companies or companies that were utilizing uh, their software in live meeting situations and, and various different things. So um, I would say uh, be, be open to also, you know, pivoting to an entirely new product um, with your existing technology, right? And thinking of new customer segments, right? How, where can I deploy my product or service right now where people need it in an efficient way where I don't have to completely redo everything uh, and that is not going to break the bank on costs. So that is just very immediate things to think about. Um, and over the long term, especially now, who knows, right? We can have a new uh, national lockdown next month. Who knew, right? Singapore uh, started easing its restrictions and then suddenly got a spike in surges and then it extended its lockdown for a whole month, right? So it's good to plan, but you can't guess or, or know for certain what's going to happen that's going to restrict you. Um, so do the best with what you can. And even if, let's say, you have to take a hiatus or pause your operations for now, that's okay. Use this time to reflect uh, re, uh, re, re-maneuver and, and, and pivot and build your foundation for what's next, right? 
it's not a failure if you learn from it and you continue to tweak it and you iterate and you build upon it, right? So change that mindset. I know a lot of people are stressed. I've gotten calls and emails from people who are very stressed and they don't know what to do. And the first thing is, first, take care of yourself. Yeah, take care of your people. And look at this as an opportunity to reinvent and pivot if you need to. Uh, and get new customers, right? Go where it's needed. So that is the, the gist of it. Um, and I think if we can all collectively maintain calm and maintain our health and our perspectives and our, you know, the, the right mindsets, we'll come out of this better. Well, that's, that's, that's an awesome and very, very crystal clear advice. Uh, so thanks be a lot. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. I've learned a lot and uh, I'm very sure that the audience would also learn a lot from this discussion and uh, they have some action points in hand. And as you rightly articulated that, uh, there is life with or without startup as well. Take care of yourself first. So that's what I'll be telling to the audience. And, and thanks a lot. Thanks for giving us time. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you so much, Deepak. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye.